Hello and welcome to Working for the Word. My name is Andrew Case, and we are right now in the middle of a series of episodes about an oral experiment in scripture adaptation. So in this episode, we're going to continue on with where we left off last time. So if you haven't heard the first part, go ahead and go back to part one. Start with that. In this episode, we're going to start off by talking about our target audience, the target audience for this project. This audience consisted of the inhabitants of the interior, where Fang is still dominant, as well as the older adults of the cities of Bata and Malabo, who enjoy recordings of Inveroyang and who may or may not read Spanish. We also strongly wanted these recordings to be attractive to any lover of Inveroyang and not just church members. So our target audience was not limited to Christians. An unanticipated audience included a local institute for the blind. This came up later. That was really enthusiastic about this. They all wanted copies of it. As well as a few young urban individuals who take strong interest in Fang language and traditions. Now, who were the people involved in this? Let's talk about the main players. The principal artist was Acacio Mbamicha, who was a skilled storyteller with a vast knowledge of traditional Fang culture. So he was the translator and narrator for all the recordings that you're going to hear shortly. Because Acacio was raised in the central region of the country, his dialect falls midway along the Okak and Tumu spectrum, those two dialects, making his Fang easy to understand and acceptable to most hearers. He's also a graduate of one of the local Bible schools founded by WEC International in Bata, which is called IBCP. Now, Acacio's brother was involved in this as well. His name is Canuto Ngi, and you have already seen him if you watched the video that was linked in the show notes of the first part of this. He is a professional xylophone player, he's a judge, and he is a teacher, and was the musical director, composer, and performer on this project. Very talented guy, very gifted, and he is Acacio's younger brother. Both brothers were raised in a Catholic family, but now they're evangelical Christians involved with the Baptist Church. Both grew up in their home villages in the interior until until young adulthood or later, and therefore they speak a high, a very high native level of Fang and have a deep knowledge and appreciation of their culture far beyond most people. Now, what was my role? I served as the principal translation consultant, project administrator, producer, sound engineer, graphic designer, and marketer. And uh, so that's what I was doing. Then my wife was the project's visual artist, and she created these awesome illustrations for the group's logo the cover art for each recording and marketing posters and she also served as supporting translation consultant and linguist researcher and worked with Fong speakers on transcriptions and back translations of songs and segments of the oral translations. She has uh, an, an MA in linguistics from the University of North Dakota and I also want to thank her for documenting so much of this, the majority of this that you're hearing right now came from an amazing amount of work that she did to put all of this together to have to share with others. And then we had many other volunteers who donated their voices for the recording of original songs and sound effects and chorus members and all these other kinds of things. Now, let's talk about how this all started. So, I, back in July of 2018 attended a week-long orality workshop in Dallas at Dallas International University and then in September I taught an abbreviated version of that workshop in Equatorial Guinea for the benefit of ACTB the National Bible Translation Organization there and Acacio and Ba participated in that workshop. Acacio and I had gone way back already we had been friends for years <laughs> 
and he had helped me with some of my initial language learning. And when he got this introduction to oral translation, it really resonated deeply within him. He discovered that he was particularly suited to oral translation. And I had suspected that for a long time, but had never seen it fully realized in him. And he later told us that both he and his brother had shared a long-term desire to preach the gospel using the xylophone and the Inveto Young style. So, this was their vision that they had had for 10 years or more. This was not us coming up with an idea out of the blue and imposing it upon the people. This was something that they had held internally for a long time and us helping them realize it. Now, how did this dream of theirs get reawakened? Late in 2018, I wrote a fictional first-person testimony of a Fung sorcerer who, after a long resistance to God, is rescued from his own witchcraft by Jesus Christ. So, it was a a really fast-paced, intense testimony of this guy, and uh, inspired by the book Spirit of the Rainforest, if you're familiar with that. Anyway, I approached Acasio about translating it orally into Fong because I had some theories I wanted to flush out. I, I wanted to experiment with this methodology and see how it would go, and this was a good testing ground or sandbox. After he read the story in Spanish, Acasio loved it and decided that it was something he would enjoy bringing to life in his own language. So we started to do this in December of 2018. And he translated it orally in the Inveto Young style. The resulting recording, which was titled The Super Sorcerer of Mokomo in Fang, the Mosamalugo Mokomo, was very enthusiastically received and it spread virally without much need for promotion. The story was considered a scripture use project. So basically, this is taking something as making something a bridge, weaving lots of Bible passages into it. So this became the bridge to do these Old Testament recordings that we're about to get into. Now, after the success of the super sorcerer of Mokomo, Acasio made it clear that he didn't want to stop working on more adaptations. He was really enthusiastic. He asked about, you know, what if we can do something something from the Bible? And so I suggested, hey, what about Exodus 1 through 15? And he agreed wholeheartedly, and we collaborated, my wife and I as consultants and technicians. But the original vision, like I said, of a biblical Mbero Young belonged to these brothers, these Fang brothers, and they had the final word in all artistic and marketing decisions, and they embraced ownership of the project. So once again, their vision was to make portions of the Old Testament and other Christian materials accessible to a Fang audience in their own storytelling form, and simultaneously to promote and preserve the traditional art forms. Now, they knew that a lot of churches would be close-minded about getting on board with this project, so their intended use was more for individuals or groups rather than immediate use in church services, although some churches did end up incorporating them into special events and evangelism, as we'll talk about later. Now, the project was a personal artistic endeavor rather than a community translation project, so I want to make that distinction clear because usually the ideal is to have the whole community all simultaneously agree on this kind of thing. And because this was not a traditional translation, fully back, translated, and word-for-word consultant checked, and community checked, and in order to give the storyteller the artistic license to tell the stories in an effective, contextualized way, we chose to call the project a scripture adaptation or dramatization. It is scripture brought to life rather like a Fong version of radio theater. So we wanted to be careful with the terminology because some people 
tend to freak out when a little more liberty is taken to communicate something in a contextualized way. And we wanted them to have that complete freedom to make this something that people would want instead of being a product that they would just listen to because they were told to do so out of duty. So in essence, our translator wanted to make this sound like it was something that was birthed out of their own culture and language. We talked about foreignization in a past episode, and his goal here, we would say, would be to have the least foreignization possible, for it not to sound like a translation as much as possible. So before the project began, we had already committed to transition to a translation project in a different country. And the success of this project made us postpone our departure, but we had a firm deadline of September 2019 to be out of the country. Now the Old Testament adaptations began in January of 2019 with Exodus 1 through 15, and then based on the average rate of 25 verses an hour, which we demonstrated during that first recording, we set the team a really optimistic goal of adapting most of the narrative passages of the Old Testament between March and September of 2019. We didn't reach that goal, but it was a good goal. And there were various reasons that we didn't reach it. We could have, but there were some external circumstances that we couldn't control. Now let's get down to the nitty-gritty detailed process that we used to make this happen. First, let's talk about text selection and prep. In considering which text to translate, we prioritize the narrative portions of the Old Testament because narrative is the easiest to translate and tends to be the genre that's most effective in audio format. The first text selected was Exodus 1 through 15, as I said, followed by Genesis 37 through 50, the story of Joseph, then Jonah, Ruth, Esther, 1 Samuel, Joshua, Judges, and Genesis 1-35. through Now, as I said, we planned to do more, but we weren't able to do more. Since the text would be translated orally from Spanish, we chose a highly natural Spanish version as the base for the front translation. So, I've talked about front translations before, and this was the Dios habla hoy version, which we used for most of the texts, and also the NIV equivalent in Spanish. So I would, or my wife would, compare these translations to other Spanish translations, including the predominant Spanish translation used in local churches, the Reina Valera, 1960, and with the Hebrew text. And based on these comparisons, we would adjust the front translation for clarity, for consistency with the Reina Valera where appropriate, and for textual integrity where necessary. And then we would also use the translator's notes provided by the United Bible Societies, as well as other commentaries, and then we would add footnotes to clarify difficult passages and explain the meaning of Hebrew names, provide important cultural context, and answer any questions the translator might have regarding the passage. This finished front translation then was transferred to the translator's computer. For those of you who are unfamiliar with a front translation, let me give you a quick overview. Basically, you're preparing a text, an idealized text for a translator that is tailored to the way he already thinks in his language. It's tailored around some of the structure of his language that has a lot of little bumps that are smoothed out so that he can more quickly get to the meaning of the text when he's translating. So let's transition now to the next step in this process. But first, let's talk about the environment that we needed. We needed an office. We had a wonderful office that was air-conditioned, well-lit, and padded with mattresses and pillows for noise treatment or echo uh, acoustic treatment. And the translator used a Logitech noise canceling headset, basically a $20 headset, no nothing fancy, with a microphone built in. 
and a budget HP laptop, probably like $200 laptop, with the program Hear This installed. Hear This is some software that I'll link in the show notes so you can check it out online. It's free for everyone to use and super innovative. So on his screen, he had two sides. There was the side with the Hear This window and the side with the base text window. So they had these two windows side by side with the text enlarged for easy viewing, only four to six sentences at a time. I will link in the show notes a video I made of some of this process so you can actually visualize it, see what this is like without having to imagine it. Now for those unfamiliar with the software Hear This, it's a program designed for recording audio Bibles that allows the reader to record and re-record each verse until satisfied with the result. Recording is done by holding down the spacebar and releasing it when finished. A final export then stitches all the individual verse recordings together into one complete audio file that's seamless. In our case, the translator worked with larger sections of text at a time, roughly paragraph by paragraph instead of verse by verse. Now, the translator always spent time internalizing the text and practicing it out loud before recording. This was done in various ways, by listening, by reading, and by days of reviewing whole stories at a time. At the beginning of the project, I would read a paragraph aloud two or three times, dramatizing it with facial expressions and hand motions. Then the translator would watch and listen intently, and then look back at the written text on the the screen for some time while rehearsing to himself how he wanted to say it in Fang. This often was repeated, and sometimes it might take up to 30 minutes for the internalization of a more complex paragraph. At other times, it might take a minute or two. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the oral internalization process, this is actually a little unorthodox because usually oral projects are done with pretty strict rules in mind for people who are illiterate, translators who are illiterate. But what we wanted to do was experiment with the best of both worlds. A translator who was very geared orally but also could read. And so combine both of those powers and see if that could make our translation more efficient, more accurate, and so forth. Now, after recording the segment, we would play it back. And Acacio would listen carefully, looking at the front translation to check for errors or any missing content. And if an error was found, he would record the segment again. Later, after learning to work alone, he preferred to internalize the text by reading it for himself carefully instead of listening to me read it aloud every time. But sometimes it was a combination of the two. And that was because often he would be listening for hours and hours and hours to an audio Bible recording of the passage that we were going to work on the next day. So what he was doing when he came into office was more or less reviewing what he had already internalized by listening a whole lot. So he took these audio Bibles home in Spanish on his smartphone so that he could spend time, especially with these longer passages. One example is the story of Tamar and Judah in Genesis 38, where he internalized it as a whole at home and then came to the office and nailed the recording in a record time. So there were a lot of little detailed challenges that we had to overcome. For instance, we had to unplug the laptop and voltage regulator before recording because they created an electromagnetic hum in the recording because we were using a USB headset which is not isolated from this kind of stuff, interference. So. We also used a soft silicone keyboard to minimize the click sound of the spacebar because here this has a glitch that when you release the spacebar, when you're done with the recording, it records that little minute click and then you have these little clicks in between your sections when it weaves them together at the end when you export it. 
We also had to stop recording after 6.30 p.m. because of the loud sounds of crickets and frogs that were impossible to block out of the recording studio because they're so loud there in Africa. Now, the translator began the project with very few computer skills, but I was able to give him some careful training and he learned to record and listen back to his work independently, relatively. He successfully translated the whole book of 1 Samuel while we were out of the country, actually, in Spain. And while I was up here in Spain, if a problem arose, then I could connect remotely through TeamViewer to his computer and resolve the issue. And uh, if he ever encountered exegetical or translation issues that weren't in the front translation notes, then he could just ask me via WhatsApp. So that's how our workflow went, more or less. Now, even though Acasio could work on his own when necessary, he preferred to have someone else present who could be an audience and hold down the record button since this freed up both his hands for the gesturing that accents his storytelling. So having someone present tended to encourage him to be more expressive and lively in his dramatization. He typically showed high performance skills, and while recording, he would burst into life, calling out and gesturing as if performing before a live audience. Just like a live troubadour, he punctuated his narrative with call and response, attention-getting phrases, and you'll get to hear some of those later in some recording samples. In this case, however, we had to record a group of voices doing the response part to be added in later. These phrases have no literal translation, but serve to keep the audience engaged and sometimes mark turning points in the story. You know, we should actually listen to some of this right now. So sit back, get ready to hear something utterly, utterly foreign that you never imagined existed in the world of storytelling. So again, what you're about to hear are these call and responses, about four of them, that would punctuate a story as it's being told. I hope you enjoyed that. So that's what these call and response things sound like, isolated. And hopefully you'll get to hear those later with everything combined. Now, once we exported the final product of the recording of just the voice, just the narration, then I would put that on his phone and he would take that home and review it and check for any kind of mistakes and other glitches. Now once we had that established we would move on to the next level and that would be adding all the other stuff, the other elements of music, song, special effects, and all of that. So each scripture recording had to begin with an introductory song and usually included between one to four songs interspersed with the narrative. Now where there was a song in the original text such as Exodus 15 or Judges 5 or 1 Samuel 2 this was also adapted to music to some extent. And let's play some samples of this, shall we? First I'm going to play for you this introductory song that they developed that introduced the purpose of the group and the power of the Word of God and other little things they wanted people to understand before engaging with the scripture. And then I'm going to play after that a clip of Exodus 15. So enjoy. <laughs> I'm a 
So what you just heard is an example of highly non-Western music <laughs> that probably your sensibilities have never been uh, exposed to. Now the, that last song from Exodus 15 is probably the most um, what we would call stereotypical of what we think of when we, we think of as, as Westerners of Africa and African music. Uh, but that was an exception. So that's that was my favorite song that came out of all of this, out of over 30 songs that we recorded. But um, you can hear and see the whole thing. We recorded a music video of it, and I'll link that in the show notes. Now, in the early recordings, Canuto and Acasio always wanted to include an introductory song that was relevant to the biblical text. So maybe imagine those little introductions that we sometimes have to biblical books in our Bibles. So imagine having a song instead of that, that kind of preps you for the story or similar to a musical movie where you have that first song that sets the stage for everything else, right? Now, sometimes these introductory songs that they would write only had tangential connections to the biblical text. For example, the introduction to the Joseph story was sung from the point of view of the xylophone player himself as, a, as though he was preparing for his journey to visit his friend Jacob in Canaan. And an existing popular melody was given new lyrics for the introduction to Esther in which the singer praises her mother's training and her own womanly skills. The introduction to Ruth was a traditional riddle of dualities, two large leaves, heaven and earth, husband and wife, child and mother, daughter-in-law and mother-in-law, life and death, etc., that the composer saw as connections in the book. Then the other songs were often sung from the perspective of key characters at emotional moments. So, for example, Joseph's brothers venting their anger before seizing him or Jacob mourning the loss of Joseph, or Ruth swearing her loyalty to Naomi, or Naomi grieving her bitter lot, or Jonah in the belly of the fish, or Jonah angry with God, or Pharaoh hardening his heart against Yahweh, or Esther praying before going before the king, etc. And Fang women often used to sing of their lovers while working alone in their gardens. So we included a, an a cappella song of Ruth singing of the husband she lost while she's gleaning in the field. Songs provided an opportunity to create unique cultural links and preserve fading cultural elements. For example, in a song about Sarah's laughter at being told she would bear a son in her old age, the composer included the words that the Fong hear in the call of a particular bird. So, for instance, this bird call is heard while constructing a new house sometimes, and they imagine the bird saying, what? A house here? What? A house here? Like mocking that idea that the person's going to succeed, and it may be, a, may be considered a bad omen. But its jeering call parallels Sarah's incredulity perfectly, and the symbolism of an unlikely house being built for Abraham through the birth of the promised son enriches the meaning of the narrative. So there's cool connections like that that came out. And I'm sure you're asking, can we hear that song? Well, I'm glad you ask. Here we go. <laughs> Send me a minute, my jumpy. I'm a minute or more, make a major. 
Ouais, ben moi. Diam, va, ndam. Ben comme on a le cas sur Mbura Jam. Dia va, ndam. Et y'a un baron qui est carré, n'a ni nan. Dia va, ndam. Saranga, bra, nanga, silin, silin, ben. Diam, va, mwanan. Y'a manga, ma belle, mi, y'a meba, bon mwan. Dia va, mwanan. No, mi n'y a mboro. Ma n'y a mi nan. Diam, y'a manga, ma belle, bon mwan. Dia va, mwanan. Et ça m'a bien fait, il et on a sa jamaï. Sa jamaï, ça m'a bien fait, voir un bon lot de voici, et on a sa jamaï. Anyway, that's just a little clip from the whole song, but it gives you an idea, and I hope it's a valuable cultural experience for you to hear something so strange, probably to your ears. Anyway, let's wrap this up. We're going to have more interesting clips down the road in future episodes. And I want to thank you all for listening. It's really encouraging that you're with us on this journey and learning about what we do. And if you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others who might find it interesting and edifying. And if you would, please leave a review. That's a really great way to help keep the podcast going. Here at Working for the Word, we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey, and pointing to Jesus. And that's why we translate it. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.